Um, the Open Textbook Network is an alliance of higher ed institutions committed to access affordability and student academic success through the use of open textbooks. Um, and so our focus is primarily around community um, faculty adoptions and recently creation of open textbooks as well. Um, so I'm happy to be a speaker on this topic, something we tackle all, almost every single day at the OTN. Um, and I'm so pleased that Jasmine Roberts is here to join us as well. Um, Jasmine is a faculty member at um, the Ohio State University. She's an OER research fellow. She's an open textbook author herself, and she is also an OTN presenter. Um, Jasmine, thank you so much for being here. Um, so I'm going to kick off and just say a little bit um, about um, what the Open Textbook Network primarily um, encounters and ways in which we address um, typical adoptions, or excuse me, typical obstacles to open textbook adoption. I will say that I do think that how we started, um, which really was around obstacles dealing with discovery of um, open textbooks, um, a lack of awareness of open textbooks on the part of faculty. Those are things that I think are increasingly on the decline. Um, that's not to say they're not important obstacles, but I think that the Babson survey recently showed us that faculty do have an increasing awareness around um, OER and open textbooks. And I think that, I mean, I hope that the work that the Open Textbook Library has been doing um, as well as other OER repositories, such as Merlot, such as OER Commons. Um, that's just a few, there's more. Um, I think that discovery is increasingly um, a solvable issue, though I look forward to hearing your questions and comments on that. Um, so I think that we're now in an exciting phase of talking with faculty about open textbook adoption because we're, we're able to start talking about some of the underlying concerns and questions that faculty members have. Typically, the questions that most come up um, when we talk about open textbook adoption revolve around two things, quality of open textbooks and finding the time to make the adoption. Um, at the Open Textbook Network, we spend a lot of our time talking with our members, talking with faculty, um, and really reminding people that um, I cannot judge, even though I am a librarian, I have an extensive background in libraries, um, I cannot judge the quality of a textbook for um, a faculty member and the learning outcomes that they've designed for their course. Only they can do that. And so I actually think that it's a wonderful opportunity to invite faculty members to engage with OER um, and open textbooks specifically. Um, oftentimes, we, that's where a conversation around the type of support that a faculty member would need. We also, that's why we have reviews posted at the Open Textbook Library so that faculty members, if they're not ready to um, dig into that content themselves, they can see what other faculty members in their discipline have to say about the quality of a book. Um, and so that's where I want to credit BC Campus for creating a rubric that the Open Textbook Library adopted um, to give faculty a framework with which to evaluate open textbook content. But I think that for those of you on the call that might be in the library community, that is a pretty significant shift. Um, for us away from um, standing by and talking about the quality of our content, excuse me, content front and center. Rather, I think this is an invitation to our faculty members to dig into the content themselves and for us to be able to provide support as they do so. Um, Jasmine, do you want to jump in on that or do you want to take your own? I, have, I can talk about time, but I want to give you the chance if you want to jump in on that. I know that's breaking the rules, Liz, I'm sorry. You're, I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, I am. I okay. am. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I yes. can hear you. Okay. Awesome. So um, I guess I kind of wanted to go through some of the barriers that I've um, heard faculty members address at the OTN workshops. And just from a faculty perspective, I talk about OER a lot with my colleagues and they're like, that's very, very lofty of you to do Jasmine. <laughs> but they're just, they're kind of like, we still don't see the the professional um, advantage of doing something like that. 
Um, a lot of faculty mm -hmm. members think that this is purely an altruistic thing that you are doing for your students. And it is. I mean, uh, for those who do know me, this is very personal work for me. Um, but there are also a lot of professional benefits that I think um, professors and faculty are aware of. So one of the things that um, faculty members will tell me or that I'll hear at OTN workshops is departmental kickbacks. So when they um, adopt a textbook from Pearson or Cengage or any of the major publishing companies, they're afraid that they're going to lose out on those departmental kickbacks. And honestly, that's something that I haven't yet quite figured out how to address. Um, because I mean that's that's a huge issue um, another one of the barriers that I think is huge and it's a part of my research interest that being the stigmatization of OER so for example if um, rumor goes around that I'm using OER in my classroom then my section is kind of perceived as the easy section right so there's almost like a maintenance of professional identity going on here um, and I think to your point Sarah just pointing them to the efficacy and the perceived quality research out there that shows that we're really not putting our students at an academic disadvantage when we are using OER in the classroom but it really comes down to departmental support so I remember when I you know um, was using OER or thought about creating my textbook and my then department head, I had to get departmental support in order to apply to the grant um, for me to create the textbook. And he was resistant as, at first. He was like, well, you know, quality, how are we going to basically attest to the quality? Um, and then I connected it, luckily here at Ohio State, our president is all about affordable learning. So I kind of used that in my pitch. So I say all that to say having that like top approach from the provost or the president or departmental support is going to help faculty a lot because if you don't have that faculty then feel as though they don't have that infrastructure right to support their OER adoption. Um, I'm just looking down here in my notes just to make sure I hit on everything. Another thing that I'm seeing from faculty members they're like yeah this is, this is really really great but a lot of faculty members want that ancillary material. And I know OpenStax does a great job of providing that, but there are also some open textbooks that don't have that ancillary material. And I think um, one way that I would address that is just by comparing it to how it is in the traditional publishing industry. There are some traditional textbooks who have that ancillary material and there are those who, who don't or that don't. And then I think a big thing just from a, how can I say this? Um, maybe just from an empathy standpoint, <laughs> there's a lot of misconception of the student experience. So my most recent OTN workshop, there was a lot of debate about whose responsibility is it when we're talking about the high cost of textbooks and, not, and students not buying those textbooks, right? So is it the student's responsibility that they're buying $5 Karma Macchiatos and $1,000 iPads? So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is still a somewhat of a disconnect between the student experience and what faculty members um, perceive of that, fac or of that student experience. And that's also a huge barrier to adoption. Just basically like, well, it's their financial responsibility. And so I think a great way to address that is just to acknowledge that there are some students who spend their money the way they want to, but there are also some students who are really struggling out there. And let's focus on those students. Jasmine, that's so helpful. I'm going to add just a couple of things before I turn it back to Liz to moderate the questions, I think. Yeah. Um, I did want to say one thing about ancillaries that I, that I tend to say is that, and I, you're 100% right, I say all those same things, you know, that in the commercial market, there are books that have ancillaries and there are books that don't. Um, but I also will say there might not be ancillary materials yet. Right. Because I do think that there's a huge amount of opportunity within um, are, and this is, this is essentially, you know, what the OTN believes that it, and I think Rebus does too, that it is about a community oriented solution to these issues. And yeah. so there's a lot of opportunity for faculty to engage with this content. Now that's not going to necessarily get you into the door, right? Those right. are, that's for, if you've ever heard of the pencil analogy, those are the people at the tip of the pencil, but those people are out there, Jasmine being one of them. Um, but I think that it's important to let people know that this is a movement in where we want that involvement and there are opportunities to be involved. Um, and that's where OER enabled pedagogy has um, wonderful opportunities for faculty. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about students um, and that discussion, Jasmine, around 
Um, you know, the, the question around the high cost of textbooks versus students not reading the book. Um, I think that it, that's, that's conflating essentially two issues. Um, that cost of the book is something that we as faculty um, can do something about. Um, and so that question about, well, they don't read the book anyway. You know, well, we don't, as you point out rightly, I think, we don't know why. It could be that they're not interested in your course. I mean, I'm sorry to say it like that, but it could be, um, you know, but there's, there's a variety of reasons. And we know that one of those reasons is that students can't afford or have access to the book and they're trying to find access in a variety of ways. So I think that conflating costs with student engagement with content, it needs to be separated because faculty can then see well, we can handle one part of that equation, you know, through this, through this conversation that we're having, through looking at open textbooks, through adopting open textbooks. Absolutely. The last thing I wanted to touch on is around time, because I know that that's such a valuable thing for all of us and, of course, for faculty members. And this comes up, I think, even more than quality. Jasmine, I thought that's what you were going to say when people were saying you're so altruistic. You're using <laughs> all your time to make this change. Yeah. And to build well, was, on what you said was, around um, empathy. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. No, uh, I was to, build, say. <laughs> to build what you said off of empathy, <laughs> I think that it's important that we are um, empathetic to the struggles of trying to find the time to change your course. It's a huge lift for faculty um, and not something for us to take lightly in having those conversations. However, um, the tack that I take is that um, all faculty at some point are going to have to look at their textbook anew. At some point, they're going to decide, and it might not be this semester, it might not be this academic year, it might be in three academic years. But at some point, they're going to look again. And when they do, I hope that they will look at this content with the variety of um, benefits that it has in addition to being able to deal with the quality question. So I think that's on, on our part as people having these conversations and supporting faculty adoptions and having those conversations with leadership in thinking about how are we managing expectations for programs that are trying to build open textbook adoption because adoption does, no matter how um, excited a faculty member might be, adoption might not be possible right away. And we need right. to make sure that we're building expectations that are realistic. Jasmine, you were going to say something and then I think one Yeah, thing. no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, I, I, sometimes I have to remind myself to adopt a new textbook it takes time. So when I think of the barrier of time, I think of creating the textbook again, completely from my lens. I not only adopt it, I literally start it from scratch and I created you know, an open textbook. But I think it's because so many faculty members, including myself, we design the course based upon this textbook instead of designing a course and finding a textbook that best meets that course, the course's, excuse me, expectation. So yeah, I think that's just a great reminder for me that adopting a new textbook actually takes time because that's gonna change perhaps assignments and, and quizzes and, and your entire syllabus, so, so absolutely. And again, I think just having that, that support and knowing that perhaps you're not the only one doing this. So for example, uh, another one of my colleagues, she applied for the same grant that I got and it, she didn't create a textbook, she just adopted. But she said knowing that I took that initial step to do it made her feel a lot more comfortable um, and to, to take on this, this time barrier because that's what she thought as well. Like this is gonna take a lot of time. But you know, I told her my story and she, she felt more comfortable with it. So yeah. Right. Well, fantastic. At this point, we're actually going to open up to Q&A, but what's interesting today is I'm actually seeing a lot of comments rather than questions in the comments field. So I want to invite anyone to unmute themselves, ask a question, make a comment. I'm going to, um, while, we, while we wait for some questions, I'm going to read some of the interesting things in the chat. Um, from C. Holland says, I have also experienced that argument regarding kickbacks. Very frustrating when they are using that money to support travel. And actually, I was going to ask Jasmine, could you, could you elaborate just a bit more on how the kickbacks work? Because I've even worked in higher ed and never heard of this and had no idea. So I, just in case there's anyone else 
wondering the same thing. Could you tell us more how that works? Yeah. So to be honest with you, I might not explain it well enough. So um, if anyone else like Sarah, if you know as well, to my understanding is, um, my understanding is that if Pearson comes to the history department and they say, hey, you know, could you guys use our textbook? Um, a, they won't give you royalties, but they will give you some sort of amount of money that you can use as professional development for your instructors in that department. So that's what I mean by a departmental kickback. And of course, departments want that funding for research conference, uh, conferences for teaching conferences. So that's my understanding, but I don't want to miss you know, define it incorrectly. So that's, that's what I'm hearing from faculty, that they get some type of professional development funds or funds of some sort that they can then allocate towards professional development. Jasmine, I think um, the one thing I, I wanna point out there is that I think that it varies. And I yes. think every, uh, anyone who's ever heard me talk knows that it depends is my fav favorite thing to say. Um, I think that it is it brings it back to what we can do, which is to learn more about our individual cultures, about what is going on on our individual campuses. Um, I know some campuses where it's nothing like what Jasmine described. It's just cookies. It's just it's food um, that gets dropped off, or you know the the box of chocolates at the holidays, or something. Like that. I mean, kickbacks can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. And I also know campuses where there is no such thing. So I think that it's um, our responsibility to try to learn more about the culture around textbook adoptions on our campuses. And I mean that in terms of the relationship with publishers as well as the timelines um, that publishers um, and faculty members use in um, communicating about content. Absolutely. And just the other day I had, um, <laughs> yesterday, which was actually kind of a bad day because I just came back from Houston and I was grouchy. I had a Pearson sales rep come into my office unannounced and he talked about departmental kickbacks, basically that the School of Communication will get X amount of money if we were to adopt this particular textbook for our public speaking courses. So, I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's happening more and more um, now uh, and it's kind of like maybe a cost savings way for publishers instead of paying royalties for them to um, yeah save save on money of, in, of some sort so but to Sarah's point yeah it, it could manifest in a, a variety of different ways not just funds for professional development it could be like she was saying cookies <laughs> So, so while we're talking about money, um, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat about um, Michelle Reed is referencing a workshop um, with a tough love approach to education. The argument was essentially, yes, maybe students are struggling with the costs, but it's teaching them financial literacy and budgeting skills. Um, Michelle says her opinion is there are better ways to teach students these types of lessons. Um, and then I have some other comments. Cheryl Clear is um, referencing the beer argument. <laughs> um, if students save money, the argument that drives me crazy, she says, is the beer argument. If students save money on textbooks, they'll spend it on beer. Um, and then Michelle mentions there's also a Starbucks argument. <laughs> um, so have you guys encountered those arguments or similar arguments? And how do you respond? We just yeah. talked about this earlier today. Jasmine yes. and I had a call earlier today. So yes. Um, this is something that can come up pretty frequently um, in, in a, conversations with faculty members. I think um, that, well, the first thing that I'll say is that in some respects, faculty are trying to um, understand what it is that we're talking about when we talk about, you know, um, the, the, the challenge students face with higher ed affordability. Um, and I think that's why a big part of what we say at the OTN is that the, the impact is not only on affordability, but on student academic success, the impact affordability has on student academic success. Um, but I think that faculty will comment, oh, you know, they spend, I think the beer argument is uh, they spend this much money, they spend more than that on beer on the weekend. Uh, the, they spend more than that on the caramel macchiato at Starbucks. They spend more than that on their earbuds or their jacket or something along those lines. And I think that the argument that um, we make at the OTN really is around um, that might be true for some students, but you don't know in the classroom which students that applies to. And we're talking about trying to support all students, access to content for all of our students. And we 
I mean, who are we to judge in that respect? You know, I mean, I think that we are trying to find ways that we can ensure that all students have access to content wherever they are on uh, the socioeconomic strata. Um, and I think at this particular time, um, we just don't know enough about our students' um, economic um, situations to be making those kinds of judgments around their content for success in their courses. Absolutely. And if I can elaborate on that, I, I just don't think it's my role as an instructor to be my student's financial planner um, and to be their parent, not to sound um, smart, <laughs> like a smart aleck, but um, it's my job as an educator to make sure that my students are successful and to prepare them um, in that fashion. And so if I am assigning a textbook that's $150, Am I really setting my students up for success? You know, so I think those are the critical questions that faculty need to ask themselves instead of, okay, well, why are my students buying beer and, and caramel macchiatos and, and all of that? And at one of the workshops where this became a, a huge discussion, there was this one graduate student who's in the audience, and I, I can't even say it the way that she said it. She beautifully articulated how we should really give our students agency, right? And you don't know whether or not that $5 karma macchiato is what that student is looking forward to all week. That's, that's not me or that's not my job to make that call. You know what I mean? What we're talking about right now is an issue that we can as faculty members control, that being assigning material that's ridiculously expensive. Liz, can I just add one last thing to that? I'm sorry sure. to harp on it so much. I do just want to say, and this is actually about how we answer these kinds of questions, um, because, you know, I see and I can see some people um, getting, you know, uh, it, it, we, it, um, yeah. blood boiling. It can be blood boiling. <laughs> yeah. It's so important um, to recognize that just as we're saying that we don't want faculty members essentially to blame students in those situations, how important it is that we don't blame faculty in those situations. Mm -hmm. As faculty members are asking these questions and bringing out these arguments, whatever the argument might be, I think that there's two important things to remember. And number one is that we're not playing the blame game here. We're not here to, we're not going to um, bring more faculty to open textbooks by yelling at them that that's a ridiculous argument and who are you to say? I mean, you know, I think it's all about how we address um, these challenging issues and challenging questions that our faculty members raise. The second thing is that um, I think, oh shoot, it went out of my head. I'll have to come back to it. It's hard. It just literally. I, I think. I think it's go important to. It away. I, well, I was gonna say. I think it's important to validate. You know that again. That we do have those students like that, and to validate their their concerns, but at the same time refocus the discussion, right? Because sometimes faculty tend to get on these tangents, and again, they're they're trained to think critically and to ask like really really, really tough questions, and so yes, they're they're. And I'm working on it. Um, I was talking to someone else, like, I'm working on my face when I present, when I hear these, these questions that are like, are you serious? Are you really asking this question? Um, but just, just reminding them that that's a valid point, but this is what we're really talking about. I don't know if you had remembered what you were going to say, Sarah, but I, I, think, I think that's a, that helps me out a lot just to kind of re-navigate the conversation and, and to keep in mind that faculty are trained to ask critical questions. Yeah. I do just want to also point out Amy Hofer's on the call and she makes a great point um, around this, this issue in community colleges around that this is an argument you don't hear as much in community colleges because food mm. insecurity is such an, a huge issue. And I totally agree with you, Amy, and I would extend that even beyond. I mean, I think you're right, but I think we see more and more um, that, that food insecurity and these issues um, are hugely important across especially um, state institutions where tuition is typically lower. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Similar to how we're seeing fewer questions around discovery, I'd be curious, you know, in a year, if we have this conversation again, if this argument too goes by the wayside because we become all the more familiar with the challenges our students are facing um, right. in those issues. It's a great Absolutely. point, Amy, thank you. Mm -hmm. And just for those who are joining us by phone, I'm also going to read Nancy's comment. There, there are also arguments in regard to the value of the text after the course. Unless you're a history major, you may not care about keeping that text, she says. So they may not put great value in the investment or life of the book, whereas 
earbuds or something else may last them years. So that's um, also a good point. Um, I am seeing a lot of questions in the chat about quality, um, particularly around peer review. Um, so I know Aperva has mentioned um, that we at Rebus are putting together a peer review working group and Earlier in the comment, um, there's Cheryl mentioned that OpenStax, OpenSUNY, and other open textbooks, including I'll add those at Rebus, go through formal peer review processes, mm -hmm. um, which can reduce some of those arguments around quality that you may be facing from the administration. But would either of you like to speak to that point more in depth? Yeah, I, I can speak from my personal experience in writing um, the open textbook. So I, I, um, I went through a peer review process for the open textbook that I wrote. It was very important to me to, because, you know, when you think of the notion of free, you automatically think cheap or, you know, low quality. So I actually went through that peer review process. Um, my department had selected four or five faculty members to review. I think it was four chapters from the textbook and it was, it was, a, it wasn't a fun process, uh, but it was a much needed process. And um, I think even in the, the textbook description, it says like peer reviewed or something like that, just to kind of let faculty members know that I'm not just writing this just to write this, that this was vetted by, you know, other faculty members within the discipline. So um, in your, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get faculty to just merely adopt or even create, I mean, perhaps in your grant program, you can um, uh, recommend that faculty members get peer reviewers if you do have like that type of support for faculty members to create and or adopt. Um, and I know a lot of the open textbooks out there, they, they have been peer reviewed. You know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, stating that, you know, some of these have in fact been peer reviewed. Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to say uh, two things. The first briefly is that there have been two office hours on this topic um, in this group. Um, so I've just thrown the link to the page for office hours on the call. Um, and so if you're interested in ha hearing much more about this topic, there have been two um, on that. Um, the other thing that I'll just say is I think that there's multiple pathways to um, open textbook creation, um, and some of them are more formal than others. Um, I will tell you, and I want to be clear, that the open textbook library does not require that a book has gone through a formal peer review process in order to include it in the open textbook library. Rather, we have very strict criteria that, that are really about use. Um, and so that question around quality, um, you know, I, I completely agree with the huge value of peer review in um, open textbook creation. However, I just want to be clear that if someone said that to me, you know, are all the books in the open textbook library peer reviewed, I would not be able to answer yes. Um, and I would say, I, to be honest, I, it depends and I don't know, um, but I would encourage them, again, to explore the content for themselves, um, to learn more about the, what reviewers have had to say about that content. Um, and we're very fortunate that we have oftentimes um, access to authors themselves to ask them for um, clarification or for um, correction. So I think that um, this is an area that is still kind of morphing. Um, so on that question of quality, I think that there's the quality in terms of the creation itself in the peer review process, as well as the quality as it relates to the course outcomes um, for a faculty member's course and how um, a textbook meets those needs. I always find it interesting how, and, and again, I get it from a faculty member perspective, how they're more critical about that content creation process when it comes to OER versus a traditional textbook of some sort. The questions that even I myself, I asked about OER were nowhere near as critical as the questions I would ask if a Pearson rep were to come into my office. So I think it's just, again, going back to the stigmatization of OER that has a lot to do with it and just the lack of awareness of OER. You know, Jasmine, I wanted to follow up on something you said about mm -hmm. the there being multiple sections of a course. And you said, you know, if you assign OER and other professors are not, then you had gotten sort of a reputation as, you know, the did you say the easy teacher or, or the fun yeah. teacher or I'm not. Can you expand on that? Like, do all teachers have to use the same textbook if it's the same type of course? Yeah. So for a general education course, and again, I can only speak for, for my department, um, for a general education course, we do have to use the same textbook. That's why it's really difficult to try to persuade some of my colleagues who teach those, you know, classes in which there are 28 different sections 
to adopt OER because they're like, well, we don't, we don't really know if we want to take that risk, quote unquote risk, <laughs> by adopting OER in the classroom. Um, but it's more so the colleagues, the professors, the faculty members themselves saying, oh, well, Jasmine, she has this open textbook or she's using this open text in her classroom. Her class must be easy. Whereas the students, they're like, oh my goodness, this is so awesome. So like the perception of the professor from the student's perspective enhances greatly. So there's a positive uh, effect. Whereas my colleagues, they're like, oh, she uses that free textbook. Has that been peer reviewed? Has that been critically examined? You know, so it's more so like a departmental stigma as opposed to students putting that stigma upon a professor. It's, it's completely, completely different. And I think it's because students still are trying to find the language in terms of defining OER. Um, they just think free, free textbook, that's all I need to know. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I was more so talking about the department and the other professors as opposed to the students. Fantastic. And I see another question, and I think this is a really good one. This has come up in a couple of our other office hour sessions, but um, C. Holland asks, um, my concern is the service that pub, uh, publishers like Pearson and Cengage are now offering universities to deliver open digital content to students for a, quote, reduced price, making college more affordable. Can y'all speak to these services and whether they are being actively taken up by universities? Oh. Um. <laughs> So it is a very, very hot topic. I do, Cla it's, uh, Claudia is asking, and I'm so glad, Claudia, that you are. Um, I'll say a couple things. The first is that this is a topic that I think we all need to be prepared to address. Um, and I think that there's not just one um, answer to this. Um, I do think that we are seeing, um, and have been for quite some time now, um, that the commercial publishers are essentially building OER into their platforms um, in order to um, essentially add on additional services um, that are um, additional services to the OER so that they can offer um, faculty um, supposedly more, more services and the ability um, for some of that ancillary content, some of that grading platform I guess I would say that I, and I know in a lot of people on this call, I'm looking specifically at Cheryl Coolier, I'm looking specifically at Ethan Senek, who's on the call, um, and perhaps they might think about unmuting to step in and speak to it. Diana Fisher's also on the call, she might have something to say here. But I think that it's about our question about what is it that we're trying to do for our students, and does this type of content also allow for the greatest amount of flexibility that um, we can also offer our faculty? Um, so I think that by centering, it's almost like stepping back from, again, that, that blood boiling standpoint and really asking ourselves, what do these platforms offer to our students to allow them to succeed at, you know, academically and with what barriers, um, either real, anticipated, um, or um, perceived are involved in those? And I think the question of, are we allowing our faculty the maximum amount of flexibility for being able to um, adapt their content, share their content, retain their content? I don't know if that's true for all of these different platforms. Um, and so I think that there's, um, it's a time for us to be asking a lot of questions. Um, Michelle Reed also, yeah, I'd like to point out she's been doing a lot of thinking on this too. So those are just some people I know on the call. I'm sure many of you are thinking on this. I'd love for someone else to speak. I'll also say David Wiley posted about this just today. And I know it was a very um, big week last week with the posting from Inside Higher Ed on these issues. So this is a hot topic and I would love to hear from other people on this call. I feel like Jasmine and I have been doing all the talking. I'd love to hear from other people on this call about what your thoughts are, the questions you're asking and your experiences. Well, I will, I will say this, Sarah, before we open it up to people who are a lot, more knowledge, a lot more knowledgeable than me on this subject matter, I think this is a great opportunity for OER advocates to go beyond the cost savings argument because that's what Pearson, that's what Cengage, Macmillan, that's what all these publishers are doing. They're, they're advertising or they're using the cost savings argument as a marketing ploy. And I think this is a great opportunity. I know this term kind of scares faculty to maybe delve into the benefits of OER as it relates to open pedagogy. And we can't do that still, or Pearson can't do that um, with their model. Cengage can't do that with their model. You know what I mean? So going beyond this notion that OER is just cost savings, 
um, is going to limit us in, you know, combating the publisher, uh, publishing industry. So, yeah. So I would love also to open it up to, to anyone who would like to speak to some of what they see as the benefits, the potential benefits, as Sarah said, with an open mind and the potential limitations that these are posing, these new systems are posing for students. Um, and also, Michelle, if you wanted to speak further on your point about the LMS, um, I would welcome that as well. In the meantime, did we talk about the ancillary materials at all? Uh, Test we banks? Did take a not yet approach. Okay. <laughs> and it depends approach. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, this is Cheryl at the University of Arizona, and um, I can speak a little bit to the inclusive access programs, and they're, they're called various things, first mm -hmm. day, all digital, um, but uh, they're, they're really growing, and the publishers are pushing them very hard. Um, at the University of Arizona, we've taken kind of an OER first approach, where we start with OER, which it may not be available, but it gives them the customizability and the perpetual access and they don't have to go to a separate proprietary platform to access the commercial content. Um, next we look for library license materials which would also be free for students to use um, and and then we also tell them that inclusive access is an option and I've seen um, comments by Stephen Bell on on uh, articles about inclusive access where he says, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, at least the faculty are thinking about cost. Um, it doesn't have the inclusive access doesn't have all of the our and library license content, but it, it, at least it's a step in the right direction. I do have concerns about how it's being marketed to faculty and, uh, and I think it's a struggle to make them as aware of OER and library license materials as, you know, it's hard for me to compete as an open educational librarian, just the only one on campus with all of these publisher reps that are running around talking to faculty. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I do want to point out, I, the US Pergs did um, a study on this. Ethan, I'm waiting for you, buddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to speak about um, inclusive access in their report, I think a, two years ago now. Um, and so I would encourage people to, to look at that. I think one of the issues with inclusive access that is in great contrast um, to um, o open and OER is that we are still putting that content behind a paywall. And so that means that our students still are going to have to pay those, the, that cost now to mm -hmm. deal with OER in order for them to do their homeworks, to be graded, et cetera. And so I think that, again, we're still putting that burden on our students. I totally agree with Cheryl that it is around building a strategy that might be um, OER first, library second. And I also would agree that a lot of it has to do with um, what the culture at your institution and the goals of your institution are in terms of addressing affordable content. Um, and so I think that those are all important things to be thinking about. And, that to me really gets to kind of how all of these questions around obstacles really are around um, thinking comprehensively as much as possible um, around kind of what your goals are for having conversations around adoption with faculty, with administrators, with students. Um, and I would be curious actually to hear from anyone on the call around ways in which they're talking about obstacles to faculty adoption with their students. Um, mm -hmm. I know that many of you engage with your student groups, and I'd be curious to hear about that as well. I can chime in a little Michelle. about students. Hi. Um, I was trying to finish a sentence and, and got carried away. Anyway, um, so we are having lots of conversations on an administrative level around our campus about access codes because um, our president does these informal 
get togethers with like pizza with the prez and students can come and talk to him about challenges they're facing. And so a number of students did one day and started complaining about access codes and how they have to pay in order to take tests when they're already paying for tuition and other resources and various other things. And um, our administration was shocked that this is a thing that happens. Um, didn't realize it was as common as it is. And so the, he kind of uh, ordered an investigation of the situation on campus. Our student government is leading that charge, um, figuring out what the impact is on students, how uh, widely, how many students are impacted by this, um, and what the student success consequences is, essentially. Um, so I learned just today that uh, the math department who uses a lot of these kinds of access code and platforms with everything wrapped in together has been getting pressure not to do that. So, um, so students can make a big difference if they, if they get involved and get in front of the, the right people. So I wanted to read a few of the comments. Um, Ethan isn't able to unmute, he's in a loud place, but he says, these are all really great points. My concern with inclusive access programs are that there's even less accountability for publishers. With print textbooks, students could opt out or look for alternatives. With inclusive access, students take their tests through the platform and they have no way to opt out. I think that's a really important thing to note. Um, also, Cheryl notes that these inclusive access programs cut out the used book market and the rental book market. Uh, so those are some interesting things. I wanted to get back, Michelle, you had a great comment about marketing um, and someone else as I'm scrolling up, there were several people who mentioned uh, the marketing challenge uh, when other terms are being used to sort of loosely encompass OER or open textbooks um, or things that are different from but similar to them and for faculty who are new to all these concepts, sort of the brand confusion that is resulting. Um, so would anyone else like to sort of speak to this to this aspect? I'll just say it takes a lot of patience and um, willingness to to carry that same message out over and over and have the same conversations sometimes with the same people emphasizing what open means and how important those permissions are for the power of open and all of the innovation that that it enables us to to have on our campuses so um it's, it's an educational opportunity. It's hard not to feel like we're moving backwards sometimes when, you know, you feel like you've reached so many people and then this other message comes in and it really conflicts with everything that you've just been teaching uh, your audience. So I, I think it just takes perseverance. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, I would agree with Michelle. It, it was just, again, I keep ragging on Pearson but, Pearson, but I think it was yesterday when I landed in Columbus from Houston, um, I got an email about, you know, the whole inclusive content, affordable learning, you know, whatever that they're selling, you know, instructors. And I, I, I have to be honest, it, my heart did kind of drop like, oh, another one, another publisher who's getting in on this. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's an issue that we're obviously going to have to address because the publishers are getting nervous. Obviously, I mean, I think it's kind of a great thing that in open education, we actually are um, having an impact and that the publishers are taking notice. But uh, I have to be honest with you, it's, 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 it's sad to see like all these publishers getting in on what they call OER when it's really not OER. But, you know, that's neither here nor there, I guess, from a student's perspective. So. I would also say that I think this, um, I, I think we can almost take a historical approach to, to looking at this question because I think that it was not long ago when we talked about, you know, faculty were thinking about um, open textbooks as ebooks um, or, you know, like how have we overcome this in other scenarios? Um, and to try to learn from those scenarios, how did we go about doing that? Um, how did we have those conversations? And so I, I think it's an important question at the same time taking into consideration what Cheryl said much earlier around, you know, she can't compete with all of the, all of the 
publishers, right, at the, at the University of Arizona, um, you know, but I think that it really comes down to utilizing the resources that we do have available to us, to the partnerships that we are building, to employing the advocates that we do have. That's where I think that public programming can be hugely impactful, having faculty members share their experiences in using OER, share their experiences in um, using OER-enabled pedagogy, and get those voices out there. Because in truth, I think we all could agree that faculty members want to hear from faculty members first, before they want to hear from the publishers, and before they want to hear from the librarians or the Center for Teaching and Learning or the Office of Students of Education. I mean, we have important roles to play, but faculty members want to hear from each other. And I think the more that we can bring those voices out at this important time would be effective and allow us to find our allies. Um, I really also just want to say, Michelle, I had no idea that was going on in your campus. And I really encourage you to share that story because I think a lot of people need to hear it. I'm sure you all have stories too, just Michelle was the one that spoke to <laughs> So, So Jasmine, you brought up a great point in the comments um, about some of the conversations that you've had, excuse me, <clears throat> on open textbook adoption with some of the more tenured research faculty. Do you, do you have any arguments that you'd like to share that you found effective? <laughs> Oh, uh, against, uh, not against, but like when they say to me, why are you using OER in the classroom? My response to that. Um, usually it's not a good comeback, to be honest with you, because I feel like we're on a different plane. <laughs> so a tenured research professor is concerned. And I, and I really, really, really hate to label professors like that because I, I used to want to be that professor. Um, but they're, they're really concerned about their, their research, getting published in certain journals and the impact factor, all this stuff that's more so cultural in essence, right? Like the, the culture of academia. Um, but when I talk to the teaching faculty, like myself, they, they get it more because they're more concerned about making that classroom environment um, the best that it can be for students. So for the tenure research professors, I, I have to be honest with you, at least here at my institution, it's it's a hard sell because they're so their focus is so 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 narrow, and I and I really hope I'm not um, labeling too much and engaging in too many stereotypes. I'm just talking about my experience. Um, the What's colleagues, oh, go ahead, Sarah. No, no, no. What's go ahead, interesting go ahead, about that, Jasmine, is I know of experiences where campuses have the most engagement with tenured faculty. Yeah, because they no longer have any um, anything to lose. They can do what they want to do in their courses mm -hmm. um, instead of that question of how does adopting an open tech, I'm going to open that can of worms. How does adopting an open textbook affect retention, promotion, and tenure? Um, you know, people that have tenure don't have to ask those questions in the same way anymore. Um, so I think that gets to that again brings back, you know, it's, it's every institution is different and the yeah. culture at your institution um, might be that your tenured faculty could be the ones that um, are going to be your coalition of the willing, while at other campuses, it might be adjunct faculty or newer faculty um, to the profession um, that, or the discipline that might uh, be your best inroads. So that's, I think, the thing that we have to ask ourselves, who are my allies going to be on my campus? Absolutely. So I think we have covered most of the questions in the chat so far. Does anyone want to chime in um, either, either with audio or in the chat? Any other questions or comments that we haven't addressed yet? Topics we haven't begun to cover in this session? I'll chime in. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So I had um, written a post there about we're really having trouble just getting some traction, getting faculty interest. We've, I worked um, for our online programs, and and I we have a small group of people. One's a, a digital librarian, and then our bookstore. And so we've been trying to stir up interest, and we've offered a couple of um, kind of brown bags through our faculty development office, but the attendance has been really low, and it, it we were surprised. Um, you know, even on our second time around, we thought it would increase. So 
we're looking for ideas to gain more interest. You know, we, we do have a couple of people adopting. And so I'm going to start bringing those voices in um, because it, I think it really does have to come from faculty that have done this. But any ideas out there? Um, I, again, a pointing to Jasmine OSU, and you've got a huge campus there. Um, I don't know if there's a, a team that has kind of kickstarted things or is this something that you uh, initiated on your own, Jasmine? No, no. I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could take credit for that. No, absolutely not. So I, I was a grant recipient for um, what at Ohio State, what we call the Affordable Learning Exchange. And it basically um, gave grant money for faculty members to either adopt or create OER um, and however that would look like for their respective courses. So no, I, I had a lot of support in my endeavor. Um, but I think that's a valid point. You know, at Ohio State and, and very similar institutions, there's a lot of quote unquote resources. But how does that look at another institution when you're, where, where are you, excuse me, literally starting from scratch? And I don't know if anyone else um, could speak to that experience. I feel like, I, well, I just feel like, you know, I mean, the OTN works with 653 campuses around the country. We have groups like, and Ohio State is an example, huge institution, a lot of infrastructure and support towards these questions. Other campuses that are really small, they're tiny colleges that are just trying to figure out how to find the right faculty. And so I think that um, one strategy that I would encourage, obviously beyond, jo beyond joining the Open Textbook Network, where we help you work on that, but on your own would be um, instead of thinking about a blanket approach, you know, these blasts was really to look for those allies. And I think you mentioned that when you asked the question, Nancy, around, you know, those couple of faculty, mm -hmm. I take a very, um, <laughs> I take like a very uh, job search approach almost where it's like, you know, have those three, if you have three faculty members that you're talking to about these issues, ask them to go talk to three faculty members each. And then ask them to talk to three faculty members each and three faculty members each and build a tree out that way. And that's the tree of people that you want to be talking to. I would look at the people that have been involved in other successful initiatives and see if those are going to be your coalition of the willing. But I think that um, email blasting is one approach. I think for this type of work, often a more targeted, um, I think it used to be like the scalpel approach instead of the hammer would, would take you farther um, in, in reaching the right faculty members and having, the com having those one-on-one -on -one conversations or a cohort conversation. I think your partnership with the Center for Teaching and Learning, Cheryl mentioned that in terms of instructional designers. I would also mention that, that often mm -hmm. Centers for Teaching and Learning run faculty learning communities that might be another um, way forward to engage the people that are talking with faculty. And lastly, if you have any entree into um, a faculty affairs or even the provost or academic affairs office where they are trying to look at those, you know, to look at faculty performance, you know, that could be a possible ally um, and a project that someone wants to take on with you. And Nancy, if it's of any consolation, I mean, I... <laughs> It, it, it from my understanding this this is a process right it's it, it takes a while to really get this uh, to get the buy-in so to say you know this this might take a year or two so I, I think that's another thing to kind of keep in mind and and to not get caught up in the end result and and you know there might be setbacks there might be you know a few steps forward but this this is going to take a while because this is a still a very new concept for faculty I couldn't agree more. It really, I mean, that idea of, I mean, a year or two, I, I'm looking at Diana Fisher. Diana's <laughs> been, she's not, I don't think she can hear me. She's been on this for so long now. You know, I mean, I just feel like it takes a really long time to build traction. And especially if for those, a couple of you have indicated you're on your own, you're doing this one person, you know, celebrate what you are doing because the fact that you're getting some traction is something and it will lead to more traction. And so, you know, as trite as it might sound, Rome was not built in a day, you know, and you got to bring the faculty with you and keep them with you that are coming and help them, ask them to help you build that coalition and keep doing it. So keep, keep going. Don't give up. Keep going. You're not alone. You keep doing it. 
Thanks so much. Yeah, and and we're not giving up. And we do have a few people that have started, and and everybody that's tried it has been um, just felt it it was really worthwhile. So I think it just bringing those voices in now, and and uh, we're just figuring out ways to get our foot in in a few more doors. But thanks. This has been really helpful. Appreciate it. And I just want to repeat two suggestions from Cheryl, which are great. Cheryl says she's found it helpful to be involved in Faculty Senate and make sure textbook affordability is being addressed in policies, resolutions, et cetera. Um, and also has mentioned partnering with instructional designers, preferably when a course is being redesigned. Um, she says it's an ideal time to choose a new textbook and go open. Great. Um, Great, so we have about five minutes left in the hour. Does anyone have any last questions? Okay, well, not hearing any. Um, I guess we will we will close up for the day, but I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, today. We are so, so excited to have you here with us discussing these topics. Uh, Sarah, did you have anything to add before we close? Just wanna give a shout out to you East Coasters for staying after yeah. hours, way to go. Definitely. Thank you all so much. It's always great to see all of you. And thank you for your questions. This is such a great community. Thank you.